are almost at the top of the hour. Um, I anticipate, you know, more attendees will start joining. Um, welcome to all of the watch party participants. We are happy to have you here with us today. Get my screen share going again. Um, this is a webinar series. Uh, the last webinar in a webinar series, a workshop series called Caregiver Learning Workshops. Um, we offered one in January, February, and March. Um, in January, we talked about dementia. In March, excuse me, February, we learned about elder law. And today we are going to learn about Medicare. So I'm very excited. Um, we're just going to let folks continue to join. I would guess um, there is a chance that participation numbers may be low. I know that some areas of South Dakota, I don't know about North Dakota, but I do know that some areas of South Dakota are receiving weather. Hi, Lindsay. Lindsay is our tech support. Thank you for jumping on real quick. Hang on, probably. She's not unmuted yet. Hello, ma'am. So the challenge I'm having for some reason, and maybe you can do it, I can't promote Carrie to a panelist. I can I got I was able to promote Waylon, but I can't promote Carrie. I I think I'm doing it right, but it just won't respond to me. Um, is anything popping up on Carrie's screen that says she's going to get kicked out and rejoin as a panelist? See, I got that, that little icon popped up for me when I clicked on Waylon's name, it gave me a little green message and then he got switched, but that message has never popped up when I click on it for Carrie. Yeah, and I don't see anything. Um, it, the... keeps, it keeps saying that Carrie Morris declined to be promote, to being promoted to panelists. Oh, how do we, ooh, I don't know how to fix that. Again, I don't see anything. It's just all I, it's just the main screen that Lisi has. Um, Carrie, are you using a web browser or the Zoom app? Um, I use the link that Lisi sent. Okay. Probably in the browser, right? Yes. Yep. Bear with us, everybody. We're just trying to see if we can get a tech issue figured out. Carrie, uh, would you be willing to tell me your email address real quick? Yep, it's um, kamorris at nd.gov. All right, so I just emailed you a new link that you could try. If you wanna jump out quick and use that new link and try to join with that. Okay. Thanks again, Lindsay, cause I was stuck. Sorry, I was late. I'm just trying to get all the snow day things done. <laughs> oh, I have no doubt, doubts. And that's what I told everybody. I'm like, we're kind of in a conundrum right now. Campus is closed, but we're still on, so. <laughs> So everybody, yeah, everybody who's in Brookings is hunkered down, hiding from the snow. Oh, and it is sure coming down here at my place anyway. Oh, goodness gracious. I've heard you guys have gotten a lot. Yep, it's it's going to be a wet spring around here. Mm -hmm. Someone's saying it's asking for a user ID. It shouldn't ask for a user ID. Um, let me try. So bear with us. We're sorry. We're a little bit, few minutes late, but we're going to see if um, Carrie is able to get in. Oh, got Lindsay. Okay.
Oh my goodness. Work for me, please. Oh, this. So Waylon, um, I think that it would make sense for you to go ahead um, and probably start introducing yourself. And Carrie, or excuse me, Lindsay will work in the background to see about getting Carrie promoted once she returns. Um, and yeah. I have no problem doing that and we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started with my introduction, but yep. um, welcome everybody. I appreciate everybody coming in, attending this wherever you are and hopefully uh, the snow stays wherever you are and does not make its way to pier. We're almost completely melted here. Um, I am the director of uh, the SHINE program. That's the Senior Health uh, Information and Insurance Education in South Dakota. It's, it's basically a combination of three different federal grant programs that we're running that I will actually cover a little bit when I get to, to my portion of the presentation after Carrie. Um, I have been in this position as a director only since the beginning of this year, so I am fairly new, um, but we do have uh, about 90 active participants uh, with the, within these programs within South Dakota. So I will be talking a lot today about the senior Medicare patrol portion uh, after uh, Carrie goes over a lot of the Medicare information. But uh, my contact information will be at the end and if anybody has any uh, questions about, uh, about me or the program and how it is uh, set up here in South Dakota, I am definitely available for those questions at the end. So thank you for coming and I look forward to presenting. Thanks, Waylon. Unfortunately, I'm sorry, everybody. We just kind of have a tech issue going on, and Carrie is not getting um, back in to the workshop quite yet. And Lisi, I don't think it would uh, really mess with the flow of the presentation if Carrie is uh, going to have a couple minute, more minute delay. If you want to just skip to my slide, I can definitely present ahead of her. Yep, that um, sounds good. What ahead. what slide number should I jump to? It looks like I'm starting out on slide 27. That's it. Okay. All right. So thank you for being flexible, Waylon. I'm going to turn it over to you and I'll mute myself again. Yeah, not a problem at all. So um, I wanted to start out by, by basically explaining what resources we have available, uh, not only in North Dakota and South Dakota, but as caregivers, I think it's important for you to know um, what the programs are, what the resources they provide are, uh, and, and then uh, we'll share the point of contacts at the end. So in the event um, you or, or, or someone uh, that, that you were caring for or a loved one or someone else in your community needed those resources, uh, you'd be able to provide that information uh, for them. So um, right now we operate, uh, both states are operating on, under three separate federal grants. They're broken up a little different between North and South Dakota, but they're all administered uh, at ACL or the Administration for Community Living. Uh, the two grants that are really part of this presentation today uh, is first uh, SHIP, which is your State Health Insurance Assistance Program, uh, and SMP, which is the Senior Medicare Patrol. Uh, the Administration for Community Living administers both those grants. Um, they're primarily volunteer programs. Uh, the majority, the vast majority of the, the workforce under both these programs are volunteers throughout both of the states. SHIP is a program that provides unbiased Medicare help uh, to the beneficiaries, to their family members and their caregivers. It's one-on-one -on -one counseling. Um, they're not affiliated with any insurance company. And, and, and as a matter of fact, we do not allow anybody affiliated with insurance companies to participate in the program. Um, so whether they're new to Medicare, reviewing their current Medicare plan options, have questions on how to use Medicare, um, SHIP will be able to provide one-on-one -on -one counselors and assistance. Um, SMP, or the Senior Medicare Patrol, uh, specifically empowers uh, beneficiaries or families and caregivers uh, with the knowledge and ability to not only prevent, but to detect and report healthcare fraud, errors, and abuse. Um, the way it's kind of structured throughout the states is North Dakota SHIP uh, is located with the, the Department of Insurance in North Dakota, and that's actually directed by Carrie, who's the other presenter today. Um, however, the North Dakota Senior Medicare Patrol for Fraud, Errors, and Abuse is located at Minot State University Center. 
and that's directed by a lady named Brenda Munson. Uh, South Dakota has everything fallen under the Department of Human Services with long-term services supports, uh, who manages all of our ACL programs, and then the SHIP and the SNP both fall under the SHINE program, of which I am the director. Uh, so I'm going to go over a lot of the SNP information, but I want to kind of cover that, and I will provide not only my contact information for SNP here in South Dakota, but I will provide Brendan Munson's contact information for North, North Dakota as well. Uh, next slide. Okay, so I think it's important that we that we cover this information, which is why I asked to have it added to this Medicare brief. We're going to learn a lot about Medicare today, but I think that Medicare fraud, errors, and abuse is a significantly large enough uh, issue that uh, uh, any opportunity we have to increase awareness and education about it, uh, we definitely need to seek advantage of. So the, the big uh, important issue with this is right now the age group for most Medicare beneficiaries, and we're talking the 65 plus for the most part, uh, this is the most targeted group for scam and fraudsters uh, th throughout the United States right now. Um, for multiple reasons, one, the majority of these beneficiaries have nest eggs set up. Uh, they own their homes. Most of them have excellent credit, and they're very trusting and polite pe people by nature, all of which is going to attract fraudsters. Uh, with more adults living alone uh, and then the doing the business online, the risk of falling victims to fraud is, is growing substantially every year. Right now, Medicare is estimated to lose about $60 billion each year, specifically due to fraud, errors, and abuse. Uh, everyday issues related to these problems affect people across the country, which is going to cost them time, money, uh, and their own uh, personal well-being and health care well-being. So Medicare-related errors are going to contribute to this annual loss, even though the errors can be honest health care mistakes or billing mistakes. However, repeated errors by a doctor or provider uh, could be considered red flags of potential fraud or abuse. Uh, when people steal from Medicare, it not only hurts us all, but it's a huge business for criminals. Uh, and falling prey to consumer scams or healthcare fraud could mean that your Medicare number has been compromised as a result of some sort of medical identity theft. Um, any money that is stolen out of Medicare uh, leaves less available funds for those needing the services now. Uh, and it's, gonna, it's going to put those at risk that are going to need this, uh, this service in the future. Next slide, please. I'm having issues with mine. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Okay, so I'm going to talk a lot about fraud, errors, and abuse. So I just kind of want to cover exactly what these meanings are uh, so you kind of get a, a relation to what I'm covering. So errors specifically, these are very common. Uh, and they could lead to fraud or abuse. However, the majority of errors we run into were just simple billing misunderstandings or misunderstandings with the providers. Uh, so the majority of healthcare providers, they're very ethical, striving to provide quality care to submit proper claims for payment. Um, however, when it comes to billing Medicare for services, it involves complicated rules uh, and a lot of procedures, which is, which is um, it's gonna lead to human error. I don't think there's any way to, completely negate human error in the billing process, which is going to lead to a lot of uh, uh, a lot of errors we need to be able to track and help the beneficiaries with. So because Medicare is complexity, beneficiaries are going to have troubles understanding their Medicare statements um, and their bills from the providers. And there's they're going to be able to pick up on suspicious charges uh, or some services that may or may not be uh, legitimate on their uh, on their bill. Uh, some examples of this of potential errors could include a beneficiary uh, claiming to have not received a service or does not recognize a provider name that they're being billed for. Uh, a billing or process error in that situation could have occurred. There very well could be two beneficiaries with the same name and the charge was assigned to the wrong name or a coding mistake on the bill, resulting from a charge to a different service than the one that's actually performed. The service could be legitimate. Um, could been have legitimately provided, but the beneficiary just didn't see the person or that uh, that was not provided while they're conscious. For, uh, for example, laboratory uh, pathologists, they're, they're under, under uh, anesthesiologist or radiologist, and they were not conscious during the time that that service was provided. So when they see that in their bill, uh, it's a, a, a suspicious charge to them. Medical rules. Uh, are going to allow for different charges in different settings. The hospital settings is a good example of that. 
what may seem like a, a high charge in a hospital bill compared to charges for similar services in an outpatient setting may actually be legitimate due, just simply due to the Medicare rules. Duplicate charges are awful, off, or often billing or processing errors. And the beneficiary may have been entered a hospital as an outpatient under what is called observation status, both the winner transferred to a skilled nursing facility without meeting the requirements by Medicare. Um, although this is a, is a concern for, for beneficiaries, it's not necessarily fraud or abuse. Uh, next slide, please. So fraud is where we get into criminal intent. The, the, the definition of fraud assumes criminal intent. Uh, this has been Medicare fraud. Uh, there is knowingly and willfully uh, a fraudster or a scammer that's executing or attempting to execute any type of scheme or ploy to defraud Medicare program or obtaining information by means of false pretenses, deception, or misrepresentation in order to receive inappropriate pay payment from Medicare. Um, uh, an email, I believe, is going to be sent out or may have already been sent out with a list of uh, some common frauds that we have consolidated in, into one list that uh, are very prevalent and very active throughout the United States. So I think as caregivers would be uh, very important for you to be aware of because uh, we actually have some examples of caregivers are the ones that have brought a potential or suspected fraud to the attention of the senior Medicare patrol so we can look into referrals or potential investigation. Uh, so feel free to share that information with the uh, with, with anybody you that the that you have available that may be interested or in a position to recognize that uh, awareness uh, is by far uh, the number one way we can prevent fraud uh, can prevent fraud when it comes to Medicare. Uh, some examples of fraud uh, is billing for services or supplies that were not provided, uh, providing unsolicited supplies to beneficiaries, misrepresenting a diagnosis of the beneficiary. Um, the beneficiary's identity or the service that's provided or any other facts that, uh, that they're using to justify payment and charge to Medicare. Um, prescribing or providing excessive or unnecessary tests for services, a good example of that with the, with the recent public health emergency uh, is charging um, uh, a lot of uh, COVID tests. So oftentimes these are expired COVID tests where they will offer free COVID tests for the Medicare number uh, and then uh, the beneficiary is receiving hundreds, if not thousands, of expired uh, COVID tests, and it's all being charged to Medicare in their name. Um, violating or participating provider agreements with Medicare, uh, offering or receiving kickbacks or bribes in exchange for your Medicare information, uh, requesting Medicare numbers to at an educational presentation like this. Uh, if I was going to come in and present a brief to beneficiaries, but I requested their Medicare number and Medicare information as a need for that education or that brief. That is, a, that is another example of fraud that routinely happens. Uh, and then uh, routinely waiving coinsurance or deductibles. Uh, waivers on coinsurance or de deductibles do happen and it is allowed, but it's a case-by-case -case basis, basis on financial hardship. Uh, it can't be a, an incentive to attract business. Next slide, please. And then when it comes to abuse, uh, Medicare abuse involves payment for items or services where there is no legal entitle entitlement to that payment. Um, Medicare abuse is also defined as instances or for practices by pro providers that are inconsistent with acceptable sound medical uh, business or physical practices. These practices may directly or indirectly result in unnecessary cost of the program, improper payment, or payment for services that fail to meet professionally recognized standards. Um, if a beneficiary has a complaint about uh, not only the billing, but the overall services and practices of their, of their providers, this is a, a potential abuse or a suspected abuse that uh, the senior Medicare patrol can help uh, either alleviate uh, and get that abuse or that, uh, uh, that poor practice that they've given at that time uh, to stop or cease, or if it gets into the area of potential fraud, we can look into referrals for further investigation. Um, inappropriate practices that start as abuse can and, and sometimes do evolve into fraud, but final determination is only going to be made after investigation by authorities, uh, and they're specifically looking for intent. Next slide, please. So we talked, let me uh, get my note slide here working again. I'm sorry, my... Uh, Laptop is not working well today. Uh, 
I apologize for this. Just one second. I'm almost back to where I was. Froze up there for a minute. So it's a day of technology issues. We appreciate uh, everyone's patience. I know. Thank it's you. The snow. Yep. Okay, so we, we covered um, the errors, fraud, and abuse. And I want to talk a little bit more about the mission specifically of SMP. The, the overall mission of the senior medical is to help the beneficiaries and the families to prevent, detect, and report suspected fraud or abuse. Um, uh, we can all help prevent healthcare fraud through education, but the SMP um, actively presents to groups uh, that do exhibits at community events, provide individual counselings, uh, and they answer questions from people who call uh, the senior Medicare patrol within their local community or county. Uh, we should all increase awareness of fraud, errors, and abuse in it through education to the beneficiaries. Uh, this is great information to provide to their families, uh, to the caregivers, uh, and all of us have a role in preventing fraud uh, by protecting the medical identification and the card numbers of the beneficiaries. The medical cards and numbers should always be treated like that, that, like we would treat our own credit card. Although Medicare cards and numbers no longer contain the social security numbers, which uh, they, they ceased to do that in 2019, Medicare numbers are still very valuable to these who want to steal the money uh, directly from Medicare. The information should not be provided to any strangers on calls, anybody that visits, uh, anybody that approaches an officer, officer or offers um, free services or equipment. Um, and we need, we need to make sure that the, the beneficiaries are treating any offer for free service in exchange for the Medicare or health care information uh, with extreme caution. Uh, rely on the doctors uh, for medical advice and prescriptions, uh, not advice or offers from medical services from unknown persons who call, visit, or approach them in public. This also means that services that advertise on TV, heard on the radio, or received in the mail, uh, they should not be pursued by the beneficiary. Never sign blank medical or insurance forms and make sure that the beneficiaries are always reading to make sure that the content is understood before signing and request a copy of any forms or documents that they sign for their own records, uh, which is definitely going to help in the event that they do lose money uh, as a result of the fraud. All that uh, information documentation would help in recouping that money. Next slide, please. The next portion of, uh, of the SMP is to help them uh, learn how to detect it. Prevention is by far the number one uh, way to, um, to avoid Medicare fraud, um, but they also need to learn how to detect it if and when it does happen. Uh, I believe just this last holiday season, by October of 2022, three quarters of all beneficiaries in the state of South Dakota were specifically targeted uh, for holiday-themed Medicare fraud. Uh, so out of the 185,000 beneficiaries in the state, uh, three quarters of them were, were targeted by October of last year. So their ability and knowledge to be able to detect this fraud is a, is a vital tool for them to have. Um, some simple tips to help them detect fraud and abuse uh, is to review their, medic, medic, or the, sorry, their Medicare summary notice for explanation of benefits, uh, also referred to as their MSN or the EOB. Um, you can help them look for products or services or equipment that they didn't receive, any double charges, uh, or any items that the doctor didn't order. Uh, I would advise that, uh, that uh, any of these beneficiaries or you as caregivers can request the use of what we call a My Healthcare Tracker. Um, these are available in your local SMP office uh, through the SMP website or by calling the local program within your state. Uh, and they help compare appoint, appointment information uh, that the beneficiaries reported to that what is printed on their MSN or EOB. It's more or less a, a healthcare journal. Uh, but the My Healthcare Tracker is available uh, for free to anybody that, re that requests it. Um, it records things like a, a place for people to record their healthcare products and services received. Uh, take notes about their their appointments, their upcoming appointments, or the appointments that they that they did attend. Gives them instructions on how to compare the healthcare services and tests, uh, or the medical equipment, medical equipment items that they documented, and it shows them how to actually compare that to their MSN or the EOB uh, on their billing statement. Uh, it's going to help them reduce the amount of beneficiary that the beneficiary owes. It may help them detect medical identity theft, uh, and it's going to help them find a report inaccuracies when reading Medicare statements. Um, it also gives them a description about uh, the senior health uh, or the SHIP program within the state, and it gives them information about the SMP program in the state, in the state as well as how to contact uh, both these programs to receive uh, assistance or counseling. Next slide, please. 
when it comes to reporting, uh, I guess the best advice I can give anybody when it comes to reporting is just contact your local, your local SMP. Uh, if anything doesn't pass the sniff test for whatever reason, we do have counselors. They're, they are all trained professionals. Uh, and they have not only the training, but the, uh, the partnerships and the resources to help identify uh, and report and uh, begin narratives to help with investigations for any potential fraud. Um, we do partner with, other, with several other state and federal resources that help look into potential fraud. And if required, the beneficiary will be assigned uh, a specialist or a trained counselor uh, who can actually train, uh, who can actually assist the beneficiary in proper reporting and referral. The counselors can help them collect necessary information that's required for proper inquiry or investigation. Uh, and it will help them generate case notes or narrative, which would potentially be referred to other agencies like local law enforcement, uh, the, your state attorney general's office, the Center, the Center for Medicare and Medicare Services, or CMMS, or CMS, uh, Social Security Administration, the Better Business Bureau, uh, and the Office of the Inspector General. These are all partnerships that we do referrals to in cases for suspected or potential fraud. The SMP can also work uh, with any of these outside partners and with Medicare on behalf of the beneficiary to help them resolve the issues. And whether they're working to resolve a billing error, uh, address marketing or medical abuse, or help the investigation and prosecution of a scammer, the counselors uh, have the training and the resources to assist in all of these. Uh, preventing and detecting is by far the easiest way uh, to not be taken advantage of. Uh, however, SNP does assist in the event that wages are lost. SNP will assist in recovering any lost wages on behalf of the beneficiary. Uh, and we had several of these cases just in 2022, where we had our volunteer counselors throughout the state uh, were able to successfully uh, assist in the investigation in recoup lost wages that uh, were a result of fraud. Next slide, please. So how can we help? Uh, that, I mean, there's a lot of information. Uh, you'll notice when Kerry presents, Medicare is a very, very complex subject. Uh, and this is a very, very common um, occurrence for fraud and abuse. And it's a, it's a, uh, it is a group of individuals that is targeted you know, way more than any other group uh, by far, not even a close comparison. So we all have a role to play in this. As caregivers specifically, uh, you can educate yourself educate your clients, your loved ones on how to prevent, detect healthcare fraud, errors and abuse. Uh, but you can be on the lookout for things like boxes of new braces, uh, known as a DME or dur med durable medical equipment lying around the house. Uh, this is a common scam and it may mean that your client or your loved one has, been, has already been a victim. Uh, remind your clients or loved ones never to give uh, out their medical numbers or any other personal information over the phone. Um, good example of a, of a caregiver uh, helping in identifying and preventing fraud. It just recently happened in South Dakota, uh, not more than just a few months ago. I'm actually, we're still in the process of assisting with the investigation of this suspected fraud. Uh, but when the caregiver arrived at the house of the beneficiary, there was another subject in the house on the beneficiary's personal laptop logged into their Medicare account and were actively changing their uh, their Medicare plan over to a separate insurance company that she claimed to represent. Um, this beneficiary was late stage dementia. Her caregiver was, uh, uh, or her legal guardian caregiver was her daughter who happened to be at the time. And it just so happened to be that this caregiver walked in when this was happening, asked the right questions, reported to the right people. And that has already been referred to the attorney general's office and the OIG who was, who was looking into it. Uh, they did, Prevent everything from happening. Her plan was changed back to where it needed to be, uh, and that information or the information of that individual was collected and reported. So, without the caregiver there and knowing what to look for or uh, knowing what some of these potential frauds are, that may have never been reported, and that could have been a case where a beneficiary um, uh, was a uh, was a victim of some sort of fraud or identity theft. Uh, when it comes to families, we need to be talking to our loved ones about protecting their Medicare numbers just and treating like a credit card. Encourage them to check their medical statements for fraud, errors, and abuse and never give out the Medicare number over the phone. Uh, help your loved ones create a Medicare.gov account and access their medical claims online uh, and remind them and help them to review their statements as they come in every three months. You can also register their numbers on the do not call list. Um, just by going to uh, the website called optoutprescreen.com, and that's going to remove them from any marketing mailings 
Uh, so in the event they do get any marketing, it's a pretty good chance that, that is a scammer. Um, another good example of that is one of the one of the alerts that SMP is putting out right now is, is plastic Medicare card scams. Um, this is happening very frequently right now where people are calling around and contacting beneficiaries or their caregivers and, and claiming that the, the Medicare is uh, getting rid of the paper Medicare cards and they're replacing them with a plastic chipped Medicare card that looks much like your credit card or debit card. Uh, and in order to receive this updated card, they need the information from the beneficiary. Uh, it is a scam. Medicare is not issuing any plastic Medicare cards, but this is something that uh, a beneficiary may or may not be aware of. Uh, so partners and professionals could help out by sharing, just sharing the SMP information on social media, refer people and clients to the SMP, uh, and inviting SMP to speak at shared events, much like this. Uh, and then healthcare providers can help by taking patients, talking to patients about healthcare related scams. Um, like DME, genetic testing, the new plastic or chip Medicare cards, these are all very common scams, uh, and reassure them that uh, the, the provider's office or the other doctors are not going to call and offer any services or equipment over the phone, uh, and teach them that the product and services should only be ordered by a doctor uh, and to never pursue any other TV ads or unsolicited calls. Uh, an example of that um, that uh, was just recently announced is there was a multi-million dollar scam um, where a, uh, uh, an individual and a co-conspirator co engaged in the scheme defrauded Medicare, and they, they, they used a call center out of the Dominican Republic. And they obtained and created fraudulent written orders for goods and services, including the durable medical equipment. And then they turned around and sold this DME to suppliers and pharmacies uh, within the state of New York. Um, it ended up, this ran uh, after the investigation was over. They found out it ran in 2019. To July of 2022, and these two individuals were able to steal over eight million dollars of fraudulent claims from uh, from Medicare. Uh, so a su substantial amount of money uh, that's been being taken away from the beneficiaries that have the need for. Next slide, please. And actually, I'm not going to go over too many of these resources until Carrie is all done. I do want to point out the. Uh, the bottom two is the state health insurance program and the senior Medicare patrol. These are the links directly to the national sites. Um, if you remember anything, I would remember these two links because by going to these links, they will be able to point you to uh, the right information, but more importantly, they can point you to the point of contact for the programs within your state. Um, that's all I have, unless there's any questions for me. If not, we can turn it over to Carrie and just have the question and answers at the, at the end. Thank you, Waylon, for being flexible um, and going first. Does no anybody problem. have any questions for Waylon before we turn it over to Carrie? Um, there's a chat box, or excuse me, there's a Q&A. The chat box, I believe, is disabled. Um, I don't have the capacity to change that. Um, Carrie? I'm on. Hello. Okay, Carrie. Let me get back to the beginning again. I appreciate everyone and their patience. Um, we just had a lot of tech issues today. So, Carrie, um, you just let me know when you want me to switch slides. All right. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Lacey, for um, being flexible as well. Um, so, good afternoon. Um, my name is Carrie Morris. I'm the program manager for the North Dakota SHIP, the State Health Insurance Program in the North Dakota uh, Department of Insurance. And today I'll be talking about um, Medicare and hopefully help provide a better understanding of the overwhelming world of Medicare, as well as going over some important things to consider when it comes to reviewing Medicare options. So with that said, um, if you wanna to go to the next slide, Lizzie. So what is Medicare and who is eligible? Um, Medicare currently provides health insurance for approximately 62 million people in the U.S. who are either 65 and older, under 65 with certain disabilities who've been entitled to Social Security Disability Insurance benefits for 24 months, or of any individual uh, who has end-stage renal disease, which is permanent kidney failure requiring dialysis or a kidney transplant. Um, in addition, people who immigrate to the US may qualify for Medicare if they're in a lawful status, 
Um, generally, uh, these individuals must have resided in the U.S. for five continuous years in order to get Medicare. Next slide, please. So when you first enroll in Medicare, um, and during certain times of the year, you can choose how you get your Medicare coverage. And there's really two main ways in order to get that Medicare coverage. First, there's option one. And with this option, you receive original Medicare, which covers part A and B. And to help uh, cover your out-of-pocket costs, you can also purchase what's called a supplemental plan or also referred to as a Medigap plan. With these plans, you can use any doctor or hospital that accepts Medicare anywhere in the US. Um, in addition, you can also join a separate Medicare Part D drug plan to help cover your prescription costs. Then you have option number two. Um, and option number two is enrolling in a Medicare Advantage plan, also known as Part C. Uh, these plans are an alternative to original Medicare for your health and usually drug coverage. Uh, these plans are also often referred to as bundled plans because they include um, both your Part A and Part B, and then usually your Part D. In most cases, uh, you will need to use doctors who are in these plans network, so your um, provider um, access may be a little bit more limited than it would be in a Medigap plan. Um, in addition, some of these plans may offer extra benefits that original Medicare doesn't cover, like vision, hearing, and dental services. Next slide, please. So before we get into talking about enrolling in Medicare, um, let's talk about what types of services Medicare covers. So starting with Medicare Part A, um, which is also uh, referred to as hospital coverage. Um, Medicare Part A is going to help cover your inpatient hospital care. So this is anytime you are admitted into the hospital. It includes a semi-private uh, room, uh, your meals, general nursing, and other hospital services and supplies. Um, Part A is also going to cover skilled nursing care. Um, and this is going to be covered if you meet certain criteria. Um, we'll uh, talk a little bit about this in the next couple slides, but with skilled nursing, you must first have a related three-day inpatient hospital stay, not including the day that you are discharged. Um, so in order for Part A to cover that skilled nursing, you have to have that three-day inpatient hospital stay. Next slide. Part A is also going to cover um, home health. Um, so uh, as long as you need part-time or intermittent skilled services because you cannot leave your home without assistance due to an illness or injury, um, that will be covered under your uh, a home health care benefit. And then finally, hospice care. And in order to qualify for hospice care under Medicare, a doctor must certify that you are terminally ill meaning typically a life expectancy of six months or less. Um, coverage under hospice care is also going to include items and drugs used for pain management, um, medical, nursing, social services, um, support for um, uh, like a grieving type support for yourself and also for your family members. All right, next slide. There we go. Thanks, Lizzie. All right. When it comes to Medicare Part A, let's talk about a little bit of the costs associated with that. Um, these costs are updated annually and can and can change from year to year. Um, individuals who have 40 or more working quarters are going to be eligible for premium free Medicare Part A. And 40 quarters generally is uh, 10 years of full time work. Um, for Part A services, this is what you're going to pay per benefit period for medically necessary services. 
So as you can see, if you're admitted into the hospital and have a hospital stay, you're going to be responsible for a $1,600 deductible. Um, and then uh, there's day increments that you're going to be responsible for a coinsurance amount. So up to 60 days, you're not going to have any coinsurance. The only thing you're going to have is that $1,600 deductible. However, uh, if you are still in the hospital on day 61 through day 90, you're going to have a coinsurance of $400 per day. And then after um, day or on day 91, you would have an $800 coinsurance per day. Um, skilled nursing for the first 20 days, you're going to be covered at 100% uh, with $0 out of pocket. However, on day 21 through day 100, you're going to have a 200 coinsurance per day. If you are in skilled nursing over day 100 on that 101st or that uh, day 101, um, then you would be responsible for all of the costs. There's not going to be any coverage after, after that point. For home health, um, that's typically covered at 100%. You'll have $0 out of pocket with the exception of durable medical equipment. So if you need any type of DME while you're on home health, you will have a 20% coinsurance for that. Um, hospice care as well is going to be covered at 100%. The only exception to that is if you are needing a medication and they order it through the hospice care, you may have a $5 copayment for each uh, drug or medication um, or that's used for pain, pain relief or symptom control uh, while you're on hospice care. All right, next slide, please. Um, inpatient versus observational status. So this is where I had mentioned that we were going to talk a little bit more about the skilled nursing coverage. Um, uh, and this is one, um, one topic that a lot of people get uh, confused about or not necessarily aware about. So one thing that we like to note about inpatient status versus observation status that we like to share with individuals on Medicare is that it's very important to always check your status while you're in a hospital. Even if you spend a night or two or several in a hospital, it does not mean that you are considered inpatient. And this uh, could and will affect whether you'll qualify for skilled nursing care if you need it. Um, you must have a three-day inpatient stay, not counting the day of discharge in order to go to a skilled nursing facility and have Medicare Part A pay for that stay. If you are under observation, Medicare will make no payment to that skilled nursing um, facility if discharged to one. So um, yeah, it's just so important that you um, are checking whether or not you are coded as inpatient or observation. Um, because observation is not covered under Part A, it's actually covered under Part B, which is going to result in um, much higher out-of-pocket costs. Um, CMS requires hospitals to provide uh, individuals that are inpatient with a notice, uh, what's called the Medicare Outpatient Observation Notice. And this notice must be given uh, to you if you are receiving observation services for more than 24 hours. So if you receive this notice, it's because you are coded as observation. Um, and this notice will explain why you're outpatient rather than inpatient, and also how it affects what you're going to pay while in the hospital and affect, and, and affect the care you get after leaving that hospital. So again, it's just very, very important that you check the status of your inpatient stay when you are admitted into a hospital. Next slide, please. Um, some of the things Medicare Part B will help cover, which is also known as your medical coverage, um, are things such as doctor, um, doctor visits or doctor services, um, both inpatient and outpatient, um, outpatient medical and surgical, surgical services and supplies, um, things, uh, things that fall under that would be like uh, even x-rays or stitches, um, preventative services, these are things like your flu shots and a yearly wellness visit, any clinical laboratory services, uh, durable medical equipment, so things such as walkers, wheelchairs, canes, uh, things of that sort, 
uh, diabetic testing equipment and supplies. So this is your glucose monitors, test strips, lancet devices, uh, therape uh, therapeutic shoes or inserts. Um, also, if you have to self-inject insulin, insulin is going to be covered under your drug plan. But if you require an insulin pump, typically that insulin is going to be covered under Part B as in boy as well. And then um, finally, prosthetic devices is also going to be covered under Part B. Next slide. Um, original Medicare does not cover everything. So if you want or need certain services that aren't covered under Part A or Part B, you will have to pay for them yourself unless you have other coverage um, such as Medicaid or perhaps a retiree health plan or if you have a Medicare Advantage plan that offers coverage for these services. Some of these items and services that Original Medicare doesn't cover include most dental care, especially dentures, um, eye examinations. Um, so for example, if you are, are getting prescribed glasses, that would not be covered. Um, hearing aids and exams for fitting them, cosmetic surgery, um, and long-term care, meaning that your room and board in a long-term care facility is not covered under Medicare. However, if you need any type of medical care from a doctor or hospital, that will be covered under Medicare. It's just that uh, your actual room and board would not be covered by, by your Medicare coverage. All right, next slide. So let's get into um, the cost associated with Part B uh, for the year 2023. Um, the monthly premium for Part B for 2023 is $164.90. Um, this could be higher depending on your income. Um, this amount, again, can change each year and uh, does change each year. You might pay a monthly penalty if you don't sign up for Part B when you're first eligible for Medicare. Um, and then you would pay a penalty for as long as you have Part B. The annual deductible for Part B uh, for 2023 is $226. You pay this deductible once each year, and then after that deductible is met, you will then have a 20% coinsurance um, of the cost of each Medicare covered service or item as long as your doctor or healthcare provider accepts Medicare. And then most preventative services have no coinsurance and are typically covered at 100%. Next slide, please. So we've um, kind of discussed the basics of what Medicare Part A and or in, uh, Part A and B covers and the costs related to Part A and B. Um, let's talk a little bit about how to enroll into Medicare. So if you are collecting any form of a monthly social security benefit, you are going to be automatically enrolled into Medicare Part A and B when you are eligible. Uh, you will receive your Medicare card um, about three months prior to the start of your Medicare eligibility date, along with a Welcome to Medicare booklet. Next slide. Now, if you are not collecting monthly benefits from Social Security, then you might need to take action. Um, in the next few slides, we'll discuss uh, who must enroll into Medicare during their initial enrollment period and those who might be able to delay their enrollment because they are either working or have um, other health insurance based on active employment. If you do not have health insurance based on active employment and you're not collecting any form of a social security benefit, then you will need to enroll into Medicare Parts A and B directly through social security. And you can do this by visiting their website at um, ssa.gov and apply online. Um, you can also call them or you can make an, an appointment with your local social security office. Also just a friendly reminder that even though you start collecting uh, your social security benefit or can start collecting it at um, the age 62, the age to enroll in Medicare for most, in, for most um, 
individuals is still at 65 um, when it comes to age. So um, some people get, get confused. They think that you know the when they start collecting social security, they can automatically en enroll into um, Medicare. Um, and that's, that's not the case. So during that time gap, they're no longer working or have other insurance, then they need to go on to um, more than likely like an individual plan through, through the marketplace. All right, next slide, please. So those new to Medicare um, and need to enroll, you have what's called uh, an initial enrollment period. And this is a seven month period to enroll into um, Medicare penalty free. It's going to begin three months before the month of your 65th birthday, the month of your 65th um, birthday, and three months after the month of your 65th birthday. You can enroll into Medicare parts A and, um, a and B, and perhaps a, pre a prescription drug plan and a supplement plan or choosing to get your Medicare through a Medicare Advantage plan during those first three months of your initial enrollment period. Um, when you do that, your coverage is going to begin on the first day of your 65th birthday month. If you wait to enroll during the month of your eligibility, your coverage will not begin until the following month. So if you're looking for coverage to start on your, uh, the first of your birthday month, then you're gonna to need to enroll um, during those three months prior. All right, next slide. If you have health insurance based on active employment, um, your, your employment, or you could be insured by your actively working spouse who carries um, the employer group uh, health coverage, um, and the employer has more than 20 or more employees, then you may want to defer your Part B. Uh, once you or your spouse decide to retire, that will then trigger a special enrollment period, um, which will allow you to um, enroll into Medicare without, without any type of penalties. Um, one important, um, another important keynote that we like to share is regarding health savings accounts. So if you are contributing to an HSA, you will want to stop contributing up to six months prior to going on to Medicare um, to avoid potential tax implications. So just um, another point to remember um, if you are um, close to that retiree age. All right, next slide. Uh, the special enrollment period. So during, during an SEP or special enrollment period, you can enroll in um, Medicare Part B if you delayed enrolling because you were covered under an employer group um, plan. However, this uh, special enrollment period is going to be time sensitive. So this is going to begin the month after you retire, um, meaning you or your spouse is no longer working or when that employer group um, health coverage ends, whichever comes first and lasts for the next eight months. Um, during that eight month window, you will need to enroll into Medicare Part B again to avoid any type of penalties. Uh, we strongly suggest starting this process approximately two months before you actually need Medicare coverage to begin. Um, we just encourage individuals to avoid that delay in enrolling, to avoid a lapse in coverage and incurring large medical expenses um, because you uh, um, really wouldn't have any type of coverage during, during that time. So um, it's important that you're looking at those options sooner, sooner than later. All right, next slide, please. All right, so we've talked a little bit about um, uh, Medicare and that it does not pay 100% um, and that you will incur Part A and B deductibles on co-pays and co-insurance. This is why individuals may purchase a Medigap plan, also known as a supplement plan. Um, and these plans will help with your out-of-pocket expenses. Uh, these plans are sold by private insurance companies and these plans can range in coverage, meaning some, plan, or some plans pay a lot for your Part A and B cost shares. Um, 
most uh, do that with a higher premium, while some plans may only cover some of the cost sharing for a lower premium. Uh, the Medigap plans in both North Dakota and South Dakota are standardized and identified by a letter. Um, so for example, um, Plan G or Plan M, uh, there are numerous plans. They uh, are plans A through N. Um, but again, each, each plan, uh, these plans are standardized. So that means that all plans sold must offer the same benefits as defined by their plan type, regardless of the insurance um, company. So if you have plan G through company A and plan G through company B, um, you, those benefits are gonna be the exact same. The only difference would be the premiums. Um, in addition, Medigap plans in North Dakota and South Dakota are sold on a guarantee issue basis. So that means purchasing a Medigap plan during your first six months of your Medicare Part B enrollment is a good idea because you will not be facing any type of pre-existing clauses. However, if you wait to purchase a Medigap plan after your six month enrollment into Medicare, then you will be subject to underwriting. Um, and that plan can, can um, accept you or not accept you, or um, you may be facing higher, higher premiums with, um, with those cases. Um, so some people, um, they, they reference plan CNF. Uh, just a note for CNF, um, beginning January 1st, 2020, both plan C as in CAT and F as in Frank cannot be sold to any new Medicare beneficiary um, becoming Medicare eligible as of January 1st. If you become Medicare eligible prior to January 1st, you can still be sold a Medicare plan C or F. Um, we just advise that you seek guidance from either North Dakota SHIP or South Dakota Shine Counselor um, so that we can provide you with a standardized Medigap rate sheet which will list all the Medigap plans sold in North Dakota or South Dakota, along with um, monthly premiums. All right, next slide. And finally, the last piece to the original Medicare model is adding on Medicare Part D, which is prescription drug coverage. Um, Part D plans are sold and administered by private insurance companies. Um, you must have Medicare Part A and or Part B in order to join. Failure to enroll in a drug plan when you're first eligible is going to result in a 1% penalty for every single month you have been without drug coverage when you should have had it. And for some, this penalty um, is a lifetime penalty, just like Part B. You will not incur a penalty if you had credible coverage through another plan. Um, however, you cannot go 63 days without a Part D plan. If you do that, well, you would be subject to a penalty again. Again, please connect with a North Dakota SHIP or South Dakota Shine Counselor, or you can visit the Medicare.gov site uh, for more information about those Part D penalties. All right, next slide. When we talk about costs associated with Part D plans, the costs do vary by plan. Most people will, will pay a monthly premium. Um, in addition uh, to that, a yearly deductible if the plan has one. Um, co-payments or co-insurance, um, a percentage of the cost while in the coverage gap, uh, that's going to begin at $4,600 for out-of-pocket spending. And then there will be very little out-of-pocket um, after spending $7,400 for that year when you would get um, out of that catastrophic coverage stage. If you have limited income and resources, you may qualify for extra help to help pay for Medicare drug coverage, which we'll also talk about in a few slides. All right, next um, slide, please. Uh, during your initial enrollment period, you will have an opportunity to enroll in a drug plan. Uh, you might be able to use a special enrollment period to enroll in a drug plan within 63 days if you're outside of your initial enrollment period. Um, this can happen if you move, if you lose your credible drug plan coverage, or if you qualify for extra help. 
Lastly, you have your annual open enrollment period. This happens every year between October 15th and December 7th. Um, you can switch to a different Part D plan. You can enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan, or you may decide to stay on the plan you currently have during that time frame. We just strongly encourage everyone with a Part D plan to review your plan options and costs during this time. All right, next slide. Uh, choosing a Part D plan. So there's help available to find the Medicare drug plan that's right for you. Um, you can do that by visiting the Medicare.gov on the site under Plan Compare. Uh, you can also call Medicare at 1-800-MEDICARE, or you can contact your um, SHIP program, so either the North Dakota SHIP or the South Dakota SHINE program for free counseling to help you compare Medicare drug plans. After you pick a plan that meets your needs, you will want to enroll into that plan. Um, plans may let you enroll through their website or over the phone. And most plans also participate and offer enrollment through that Medicare.gov site or by calling Medicare as well. All right, next slide. You may also receive your Medicare benefits through private health insurance companies who offer Medicare benefits in the form of HMOs or PPOs called Medicare Advantage plans or Part C plans. To be eligible for a Medicare Advantage plan, you must have both Medicare Part A and B and live in that plan service area. Um, by choosing to receive your benefits through a Medicare Advantage plan, you must still continue to pay your Medicare Part B premium. So you may have two, two premiums. The plan must offer everything original Medicare covers, but may offer additional benefits such as vision, dental, and hearing. However, there may be coverage limits to those services. Um, most of the plans offer drug coverage, which, satisfy, which satisfies the criteria of having a Medicare Part D plan. And then again, you will also need to use healthcare providers and facilities who participate in that particular plan's network. Um, and again, most plans uh, do offer out-of-network coverage. Okay, next slide. Just like Part D, if you select a Medicare Advantage plan, you can enroll during your initial enrollment period, um, a special enrollment period if you qualify for one, during that annual open enrollment period, which again is each year from October 15th through December 7th, or during the Medicare Advantage open enrollment period. The Medicare Advantage um, open um, enrollment period is annually from January 1st through March 31st. You must already be enrolled in a Medicare Advantage plan, and during that time, you can change from one Medicare Advantage plan to another, or you can choose to go back to original Medicare. Um, if you do enroll into a new Medicare Advantage plan, then your plan will start only the following month after you enroll. All right, next slide. Um, another thing that we really like to um, really hone in on and share is that there is help for individuals that have limited income and assets. Um, there is a, a few different programs. Um, the first one is the Medicare Savings Program. This has three levels of it. Um, the level of assistance will be determined on your monthly gross income or combined monthly gross income if married. But regardless of what level you qualify for, the Medicare Savings Program will um, help pay your monthly Medicare Part B premium, and in some cases, your Part A and B cost shares. Um, and also by enrolling into the Medicare Savings Program, you will be automatically entitled and enrolled into the Low Income Subsidy Program, also known as Extra Help, um, which that is the next program. The, LIS or Extra Help Program helps make Medicare Part D or, um, and your covered drugs more affordable. So your covered Medicare Part D drugs, regard, regardless if you have a standalone Part D plan or if you have your coverage through a Medicare Advantage plan, it will cost you no more than $10.35 per prescription. Um, the LIS program helps pay your Part D premium and this also holds true if you enrolled in a Medicare Advantage plan with a drug premium um, as well. However, you will receive premium assistance with the drug plan premium only if you are in one of those plans. Next slide. 
And then finally, the third uh, program is Medicaid. Uh, this is another resource for individuals with limited income and resources. Um, Medicaid helps pay healthcare costs for people who qualify. Medicaid is a joint federal and state program, but it's administered by the Department of Human Services in North Dakota um, and the Department of Social Services in South Dakota. Some people qualify for both Medicare and Medicaid, and these programs can often be confused with each other. And this next slide, um, we'll kind of go over what those differences are. So Medicare is a national program that is consistent across the country. Medicaid, however, consists of statewide programs that vary among states. Um, Medicare is administered by the federal government. Medicaid is administered by state governments within broad federal rules. Um, however, there's that federal and state partnership. Medicare is health insurance for people 65 and older, people under 65 with certain disabilities, or any age with end-stage renal disease. Medicaid is, again, health insurance for people based on need with um, financial and some non-financial re requirements. And then lastly, Medicare is the nation's primary payer of inpatient hospital services to the disabled, elderly, and people with um, end-stage renal disease. Medicaid is the nation's primary public payer for acute health, mental health, and long-term care services. So a lot of people are, are confused by them, and there's some that are qualified for both, which is called dual eligible. So it can be a little confusing for um, what, what covers what on um, some of those plans. All right, next slide. All right, and then finally to wrap this up, just um, some key points to remember about your Medicare coverage. Um, again, Medicare is a health insurance program. It does not cover all of your healthcare costs. So you do have choices in how you get your coverage and you do have decisions that you need to make. Um, it's important to know that you need to take action and these decisions can affect the type of coverage that you get. And often these certain decisions are very time sensitive. So it's important that you kind of know what time frame that you are looking at. And um, lastly, these programs, uh, or there are programs for people with limited income and resources. So again, we have individuals um, through the North Dakota SHIP and the South Dakota SHINE program that can help individuals with these resources. Well, that concludes our presentation. I know we went a little bit over. Um, I'm not sure if we have time for any questions. Um, be happy to answer any if anybody has or if we have time to answer any. We'll see. I haven't seen any questions come through um, Q&A yet. Um, if you have a question, please feel free to type it in that Q&A. And I'm sorry about the tech issues. That's probably why we ended up going over, but we, we got it figured out. Thank you to Carrie and Waylon for just adapting and making it work. And I do apologize from the screen and any um, distractions that may have appeared. Um, I was, we had truck tech issues and people were emailing me. Gotta love it. Yep. So would you explain about the cost for long-term care again? So, um, yeah, so Medicare does not cover um, long-term care. Um, the Medicare will cover um, if somebody is in a long-term care facility and, um, you know, has to go to their doctor or needs um, some type of medical care by um, somebody that is going to be billing Medicare directly as a provider or, um, well, the facility wouldn't, wouldn't bill Medicare directly, but some, some people get, get confused. They think that once they're in long-term care or assisted, you know, living care, um, that is going to be covered by Medicare. And the, the room and board is going to be um, maybe covered under like long-term care insurance if they, have, if they have some type of insurance for that, or they would be paying that out of their, their own pocket. Um, so yeah, there's, there's no long-term care coverage under Medicare. It's just that um, if you need medical um, care while, while you're in that, facility, the medical care would then be be covered. But of course, typically you would go to your your doctor or clinic or hospital for, for those services. 
Awesome. Thank you, Carrie. Um, Jenny writes, can you clarify what hospice coverage is and when someone in a facility or hospice house uh, and not at home? So can you talk a little bit about house hospice coverage under Medicare? Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, some of these, um, Medicare is extremely um, in-depth and, and, and overwhelming. I mean, this is probably something we would like to visit on more of a of a one on one. Um, we don't necessarily have all of the medical criteria that um, Medicare reviews when when it's um, hospice care. But um, I do know that a doctor has to um, that that they have to meet certain certain cri criteria. Um, you know, they, they have to be diagnosed uh, terminally ill. Um, there has to be certain certain things in order for it to be covered. Um, so it just, that's going to kind of depend on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but if you are eligible for hospice care, it is going to be covered at 100% minus any type of um, pain meds that you may, may need. And forgive me if you covered this generally to be eligible for hospice care, two doctors have to certify you're within the last six months of life. Is that that's correct, right? Um, you know, I I don't know that off the top of my head. I would actually have to look at the Medicare um, coverage for that, um, unless Waylon happens to know. But I uh, that would be something I would actually have to look look at. Okay, thank you. So we got two more questions. I do recognize that many of you may have to drop off. I, I We do apologize for the challenges. So the next question, when dual covered, who is the primary insurance, Medicare or Medicaid? Um, well, <laughs> well, and you might have to jump in and, and, and help me here. Um, again, I think this is, it, it depends on, on what it is. Um, Medicare is typically going to be the primary. Um, well, and correct me if I'm if I'm misspeaking here. Um, but I know Medicaid also covers covers things that Medicare doesn't. Okay, so it's the, the next easiest way I could explain it as well. It really depends on uh, on what is being covered, one may take over as the primary over the other, but I think primarily Medicare is, is primary. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. So the next question is ship or shine a free service? And that is correct, it is free, right? Yep, absolutely. Yes, we are a free service. Um, not a lot of people um, know, know about us. We're kind of that, that um, hidden hidden secret gem that um, we like to we like to um, share about. Um, yes, we are absolutely free. Um, we offer you know different, not only um, education on on Medicare, um, but you know also if somebody's having issues with their Medicare bill or they're needing um, assistance through an appeal process, uh, we can we can help with a variety of different things. So. Um, yes, please, please contact us. And that is the same for Shine for SHIP in SNP. Everything's 100% free to include the one on one counseling. And I did notice just looking at the contact list that uh, Brenda Munson, the director for North Dakota SNP, has joined the channel as well. So if anybody had questions specific for North Dakota, uh, I believe she is still in the group. Awesome. So Jenny asked a little bit of clarification, and I'll apologize to the group for the chat not being working. We're going to make that work next time but she what she's getting at with hospice is she doesn't believe room and board is covered when a pers person is eligible for hospice um well I, it, I guess it would it would depend again like is is hospice being done at home or is it being done in a in a nursing home it just it really depends on what the situation is um you know, I guess I I would encourage them to to call. Uh, I'm not sure where that where that individual is located if they're in North Dakota or, or South Dakota, but I would encourage them to contact um, whatever state they're in is to contact us directly, and we can definitely walk. You know, um, kind of get the whole the whole gist of, uh, of what may be occurring in that situation, um, so that we can we can give them the correct information. 
Okay. Awesome. Thank you. And Waylon's asking a, or answering a question about South Dakota Shine having resources that libraries could give to patrons. Um, I assume that's true for both North Dakota and South Dakota, correct? Yes. Yep, absolutely. Yep, we have a variety of different um, organizations uh, throughout North Dakota as well that um, uh, distribute our, our, our ship contact information and also volunteers throughout the state that, that can help. And it'd probably be easier just to answer to everyone on this, but the ship in SP in South Dakota, we do have the bookmark flyers, posters, things like that to hang up at. Uh, we do it a lot in senior centers and libraries. But in addition to that, all the fraud alerts that are being put out by SP, we do have infographics and posters for those as well. If you're interested, and those are all um, produced by SP or Shine and their free of charge. Very good. Thank you, everybody, for staying on so we could get our questions answered. This webinar was recorded. I will email the recorder after it's available. Um, it's got to be edited to clean it up a little bit, so it may take a little bit longer um, than normal. You will receive an evaluation link for this webinar. Please give us feedback. Um, that helps us report to our leadership in North Dakota and South Dakota about these workshops and the value that they offer to other people. So again, um, Carrie, Waylon, I don't know if you have any closing things, but we're done for the day. All right, well, thanks for having us. You, thank you both. No problem, thank you for the invite. And Lisa, if I, if I could just recommend one thing, because I know it kind of got glanced over with the, with the presentation getting switched. If you just throw the resources page up for anybody that wants to copy those resources. Well, I will email these slides to everybody. Oh, so perfect. These slides will go out to everybody along with an ex, uh, an additional research, re, excuse me, resource provided by Waylon with expanded information about frauds and scams related to Medicare. Thanks, everybody.